Rob, you know how easily I get depressed. Well, you might want to check out that Mortal Kombat 2 video. Oh, all right. So a couple years ago, in anticipation for Mortal Kombat X, we here at the Brotherhood of Gaming.com did a Sega Genesis vs. Super Nintendo review of the very first Mortal Kombat. And by popular demand, you guys want us to check out the second game, Mortal Kombat 2. And well, since we are the people's choice for best YouTubers of 2017... You can't prove that. But you can't disprove that! Eh, yeah, I guess that's true. Haha! <laughs> so we honored that request. And well, since we did, we might as well finish this off, right? So let's check out the third leg of this 16-bit trilogy. Here is our Sega Genesis vs. Super Nintendo review of Mortal Kombat 3. So after the success of the first two titles, what did Ed Boon, John Tobias, and the rest of the crew at Midway have in store for Part 3? The game was originally released in the arcades on April 15, 1995, and the home console versions would come out afterwards on the Sega Genesis, Super Nintendo, and Sony PlayStation. Now obviously the Sony version was the only one that was exactly identical to the arcade due to the more advanced hardware, and there were also versions released on the Game Boy and Game Gear as well. Just FYI. Anyway, on with the plot summary. After Shao Kahn gets his butt kicked by Liu Kang in the previous game, he decided to interact his 10,000 year old plan to finally conquer Earthrealm. He used Dark Priest to resurrect his former wife Sindel on Earth, thus allowing him to reach across dimensions to reclaim her. With this, Earthrealm is merged with Outworld, stripping billions of their souls. Exactly as planned. Hey, don't look at me, I didn't write this. So with Khan taking over Earth, he sends his death squads to kill Earth's survivors, which included Johnny Cage. Ah, oh, shoot. Well, he does come back when the timeline is reset, so... Well, just go play Mortal Kombat 9, you'll see what I mean. The remaining Earth defenders are sent out to stop Khan once and for all. Except for Raiden, who can't get involved for reasons. And I'm sure they're important. The game also features some subplots as well, such as some members of Outworld turning on Khan and joining the Rebellion. These stories are told through dialogue texts that you can see at the beginning of the game. I personally don't know what to think of this story. Now, on one hand, it is the most ridiculous of them all, but I guess a warlord like Khan would have a backup plan. And I do admire the effort in trying to tell an interesting story to go along with the gameplay. So now let's examine the Super Nintendo. The game utilizes all of the buttons on the controller with six separate functions. There is a high and low punch, a high and low kick, a run, and a block. The button placement can be configured in the options menu, along with the usual up, down, left, and right on the D-pad. As is the case with Mortal Kombat games, you have to remember to push the button in order to block. Holding back on the D-pad will do nothing but let you eat fireballs. It is something that really forces you to not always rely solely on the attack buttons, so you'll need to block incoming attacks and wait for openings to strike. If not, well, there'll be plenty of times when you'll be overwhelmed by incoming attacks. The run button is kept track thanks to a small meter below the health bar. You cannot run backwards, only forwards. In my opinion, however, I did not find the run button all that useful. Now I do understand the functionality as it can get you in close, but more often than not I just found myself running in into attacks head first. But if you're more talented than me, then I'm sure you'll find better ways to implement it. As for me, I prefer to stick and move and play more defensive before unleashing my assaults. With rapid presses of either of the punch buttons, you can do the classic rapid punches. A duck with a heavy attack will do the trademark MK uppercut, along with the spin kicks, sweep kicks, and grab tosses. Something newly added in this game was the inclusion of chain combos. 
With this, you can enter a string of attacks that cannot be interrupted, allowing a good deal of damage to be performed. Every character, of course, has his or her collection of special moves that you can perform by inputting the correct sequence. The number of moves that each character has does vary, but they're all unique. Now, each character does have their strengths and weaknesses. This prevents one fighter from becoming too overly cheap, as there are ways to get around their attacks. Although Sub-Zero can get pretty close with his freezing. <laughs> I like using him a lot, as you can see. The cast of characters included in this game is an interesting bag. There are eight from the past two games, which include Jax, Kano, Kung Lao, Liu Kang, Sonya, Sub-Zero, Shang Tsung, and Smoke. The newer characters introduced here are Cyrax, Cabal, Sector, Nightwolf, Shiva, Striker, and Sindel. Yeah, that's Sindel. You're alive. Too bad you will die. Now, unfortunately, the cast does omit some notable favorites like Raiden, Johnny Cage, and Scorpion, to name a few. In their place are a lot of the mechanical ninjas like Sector and Cyrax. Now, they're not bad characters, just not as memorable as the others. When you are in the main menu, you can choose the options menu in order to make adjustments like difficulty, controls, etc. You can then choose Start Game to begin your game. You can choose to compete in the three towers, Novice, Warrior, or Master, each higher than the last, and fight your way through a series of enemies before facing off against the sub-boss Motaro and the big guy Shao Kahn, who is as cheap as hell. The stages ditch the oriental feel from the previous game here and go for a more modern western look, like open streets, subways, bell towers, and such. Some of the stages have transitions to other areas and their own fatalities that you can perform. Speaking of which, all the fatalities return as well. When you drain your opponent's health to zero and input the correct command, you can perform them. Not only that, but each character has two fatalities, a friendship, a babality, a stage fatality, and the new animality where your opponent changes to an animal to finish them off. There's also a thing called Mercy, where you can give your opponent a small sliver of health at the finish of screen. Pretty ballsy. There's also another concept called Combat Code, which is a six symbol code that you can enter on the versus screen on a two player game. This can help you modify gameplay and allow you to fight hidden characters, among other things. Hey Jane, stop hogging the controller and let me play some. Oh, sure. that Sega Genesis port. Well, here's the thing about it. I found out really quick that the game is virtually unplayable for me on the original Sega controller, so I had to borrow Will's six-button controller, which is really the only way to play this game. While the Sega Genesis version is just as playable as the Super Nintendo, there is a big downgrade in the visuals. The Super Nintendo graphics are so bright and beautiful, it is certainly the better looking game. But on the Sega Genesis one, the visuals, especially on the character models, are more blurry, and they appear smaller than the Super Nintendo ones. The same goes with the sound effects and the music. While it is all right on the Sega Genesis, on the Super Nintendo, again thanks to its more powerful hardware, it just sounds more pleasing to the ear. It seems like after the first game, when Nintendo started allowing their blood effects, their versions of Mortal Kombat began to outshine the Sega ones. Now last but not least, you have, of course, the great secrets and game codes. On the Sega Genesis, you can enter a series of button commands to access the secrets, cheats, and killer codes. Through these codes, you can make Smoke playable, adding more credits, like up to 95, which is really helpful, and playing a hidden game, which is kind of like Galaga. Okay. The Super Nintendo has more special codes than the Sega Genesis one. In addition to the ones I mentioned earlier, you also have the ability to pause the game. That right there is enough to put it over, especially if you get a phone call or you have to go to the bathroom due to some bad tacos you ate earlier. Oh, come on, we've all been there, don't lie. Mortal Kombat 3 is an interesting creature. While on a technical level, the game is superior to the first two games, but also many see this as the beginning of the end as it began to decline in its initial popularity. From my point of view, I did enjoy it just as much as the other two games. 
it is a shame that it does not have many of my favorites from previous titles, and some of the new ones don't quite pique my interest. Well, except for Sindel, for obvious reasons. Too bad you will die. That never gets old. But for these incarnations, I definitely prefer the Super Nintendo one, for the reasons I described earlier. And if you're going to get the second one, just make sure you have that six button controller. Trust me, it helps. Well, there you have it, our review of Sega Genesis for Super Nintendo Mortal Kombat 3. So, which version did you guys prefer? Let us know in the comments section below. Personally, though, I'm just glad I was able to share my opinion on all the 16-bit Mortal Kombat. <laughs> oh, hey, Gene, look, I know you're in the middle of one of your whatever reviews going on, but I got a package for you in the mail, which admittedly is kind of strange because you don't live here. Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3? Yes! Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3!